So an interesting question is the how we would treat the panel would uh, consider treating ITP in CLL. I think this in some CLL patients is, is the most challenging diagnosis to make because you see a fair number of patients with stage zero mm -hmm. you know, disease that have isolated thrombocytopenia with a platelet count in the 80 to 90. And you marrow them often, you see 50 to 60 percent CLL and you see adequate megakaryocytes and you know, their disease can stay stable for a long period of time. You know, and, and that patient probably has a component of chronic, you know, of chronic ITP. What, what we don't like to see is that patient that I just described, that you get a call, you get a call and they're, uh, you know, they're having petechiae and you bring them in, their platelet count is one. Right. And, you know, you know, and there, you know, we have a classic, you know, we have a classic way of, of managing ITP where you would give methyl, methylprednisolone or prednisone and often, you know, and often, and often immune globulin if you really want to get them up quicker. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a couple of studies that have looked at you know, the addition of rituximab as well earlier, that that may you know, improve the you know, rapidity of the response and more importantly, the ability to get people off of, you know, of corticosteroids. And that's, that's something often in our practice we will, you know, we will do because you know, the challenge with both ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia and CLL is not necessarily getting it under control, but it's getting patients off steroids you know, once, you know, once you have it under control. I agree. I think that it's important to uh, uh, rituximab, however, has not worked 100% of the time. And so we have patients who have fairly intractable immune thrombocytopenic purpura or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And as we were discussing before, I think if a patient really has life-threatening cytopenias from autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP, I think strong consideration should be given to discussing the potential for splenectomy. Uh, splenectomy now can be done laparoscopically. Uh, the spleen is embolized and it's sucked out through a straw. Patients have very little post-surgical morbidity. And I think that the uh, episodes that they might have and recurrence of ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia appear less severe and less life-threatening. And we've had patients now out 15, 20 years after splenectomy and I've not observed that there's a uh, increased incidence of infection. I think in kids it can be a problem. Uh, splenectomy in, in children, particularly those with Hodgkin disease, have had problems with fulminant uh, infections uh, and pneumonia, but we're not seeing this in the adults. Do you give uh, prophylactic antibiotics lifelong then? Some people recommend it, well, some we, people don't. We do immunize against uh, pneumonia. Mm -hmm. We make sure that they have prior, other, to, the prior to the splenectomy. How about post? And I think that uh, after the, uh, I think we have to be vigilant for infection irregardless of splenectomy and CLL. Mm -hmm. I tend to be more liberal in the use of intravenous immunoglobulin, which can also be steroid sparing. Uh, intravenous immunoglobulin also can mitigate the cytopenias and help, but also has the added advantage of improving their outcome in resisting infections mm -hmm. or in overcoming infection. So uh, the combined use of IVIG, um, glucocorticoids, uh, then going with anti-CD20s, but I think the uh, problem we have is that it doesn't invariably work, particularly if there's differentiation to plasma cells which are making these autoantibodies where they don't have the CD20 present. Uh, and then you might have to fall into other uh, things which uh, uh, should be considered perhaps after having taken out the spleen if you can. Obviously you don't want to do that in the heat of the night, but it should be done electively. Uh, is, is important to, to do, I think, because it can, uh, I think, potentially keep patients from having very life-threatening episodes. I mean, occasionally you'll see an accessory spleen that's been missed. And yes, but I that think that this is um, not very common. Actually, um, it might be common. It didn't change any. I, I just like to recall a patient that um, was so resistant, had actually um, such resistant disease <coughs> that, and it was uh, in addition, it was similar to, we're talking ITP, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, that was life-threatening. And I think the hemoglobin would drop down to 4, 3.5, 4. And the only thing that worked after everything you just mentioned in splenectomy and then went after an accessory spleen was actually alemtuzumab. And alemtuzumab worked dramatically, and actually this patient would have been dead. And after a prolonged exposure to alemtuzumab, when we stopped, we must have eradicated whatever, where there was a clone uh, contributing and has not had a recurrence for over four years. And had I have found a very similar experience for yeah. a patient who have refractory autoimmune hemoly hemolytic anemia. So mm -hmm. those patients who failed rituximab treatment, 
uh, actually often respond to alumtuzumab treatment. Yeah, I think it's important so I do to remember, remember that. Yes. There's a pr real provocative abstract from Kerry Rogers uh, at this meeting, where you know, looking at you know, looking at a big cohort of CLL patients treated with ibrutinib, where you know, a, a large number, about 30 percent, had had a prior history of autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP bef at some time before. And the entire time that they were on ibrutinib, it didn't, you know, the problem didn't recur. You know, and there was a second study that's in the B, that's in the B book of the, of this meeting, so it's not going to be presented. You have the resonance study looking at autoimmune complications, and essentially in the ofatumumab arm, there was about a 20 percent incidence of autoimmune complications during or before they went on to ibrutinib, and there wasn't a there wasn't a recurrence of autoimmune hemolytic anemia on the ibrutinib arm. You know, so so that's and and I've I've had that my my experience. Is of, of having patients that have come on in, with ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia and seeing that problem get better as their CLL gets better. I, I, think it's I had similar yeah. anecdotal experience. I think it's everything. actually very important to keep in mind is that the sick inhibitors were first investigated as uh, ITP agents before they actually came into lymphoid malignancies. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot of data suggesting that BCR antagonists do have a role to play in these autoimmune cytopenias. One of the things that I've always found very difficult with the patients, you know, and very akin to what John had just described, is not the patient whose play that counts 80,000 with a marrow that might be 50% CLL, but there's certainly a lot of patients who walk in with play that counts in the 40,000s yeah. who've got a marrow that's 100% CLL. And the question always becomes, is that ITP or not? And, you know, they'll have a normal hemoglobin and, you know, some lymphadenopathy, but not a lot. So you're really talking about just one cytopenia. And so I think it's actually a very important thing to keep in mind with a lot of the patients. That so what would your approach be? So I guess we've always been taught that you treat the underlying disease, you'll also take care of the ITP. But in, say in the situation, somebody doesn't need therapy for their CLL, but platelets drop down to 30, they're dropping to 25. Would you treat the underlying disease or would you try steroids first or something to try to treat just the ITP? So if I really have a suspicion, and I really mm -hmm. think that, you know, some important predictors would be along the lines of seeing giant platelets, seeing, you know, evidence of uh, increased platelet turnover, really try and rituxan and steroids first in those patients. Now, the one caveat to that, and this I think is very important, is that person with the marrow that's 100 percent, that's developing an autoimmune complication, is someone who's not very far from needing treatment for their CLL. Okay. So I, I don't, you know, from my perspective, that's a reason to treat their CLL e as well. Even, I saw it to be controversial, even in that patient, I, you know, I've treated patients with, with steroids and, and rituximab and, you know, have seen patients go for a considerable amount of time because you can fix the pro you can fix both I've problems. Done the same thing. Yeah, or, yeah, or improve that you're not going to get as effective right. a treatment for the CLL, but they can do very well, especially elderly patients. Right. Especially when you start yeah. talking about regimens like high-dose methylprednisolone, yeah. which really treats both very nicely. We've used that high-dose methylprednisolone and rituximab for our patients and actually have had very good success in, in, in cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But I must say, if your platelet count is below 100,000, I guess that's an accepted uh, criterion for treatment at stage 4 disease or stage B. But I do think it's correct. I mean, uh, there's also the element of splenic sequestration in that some patients may actually have what appears to be adequate megakaryocytopoiesis in the marrow, maybe 30% involvement. You see many megas there, not so many as you would expect in ITP, but their platelet counts are lower than you would anticipate. And in this case, it, it does appear there's splenic sequestration going on. And you know, I think that for the real challenging patients, you know, the thrombopoietin agonists have found you know found a place in, in chronic ITP, and you know there there are a couple of of abstracts showing that they work in the setting that it's in the NCCN guidelines, but it's something right. probably in our practice, you know, we've used it, they work, but it's it's something that's used much later often because you know, because of the cons because of the cons the concerns of yeah. of side of, you know, you know of of side effects although they are so, so let me just ask the panel I mean in some cases where you have a patient that has refractory or resistance say ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia splenectomy is not a good uh, surgical candidate I will use splenic irradiation in an elderly patient and I actually can get the same impact as a splenectomy meaning that it's functionally, the spleen is, it actually does work and you can see improvement. I don't know if anybody else uses, I mean like I, old patient, not a good surgeon. I'd I, I, I throw, throw out my bias that yes. you know, when you get past a second line therapy mm -hmm. in ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia, where I've, that's, that's sort of where I've seen people hurt by different regimens. You know, so so yeah. I, it, it's with somebody in practice, 
I would say that's really the point where you refer somebody and you work with somebody because because you know I've done that as well. How do you split it? I've used it. I've yeah. used it on Very rare rarely. occasions. Yes. But I mean, but I mean, there's really an art to managing these patients okay. that have these these autoimmune complications that don't respond to traditional therapies. And you don't want to stop your treatment too soon because it'll come right, right back and things like that. And the you know the splenic irradiation yep. is associated with significant cytopenias, and so it's not something just to be entered lightly. I mean, I've I've not had a case to use, and I've been able to rescue patient with other agents.